So is it better just doing it late? Uh, <laughs> better if you can get here early. <laughs> You ready? Okay. Good evening. We'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order on Monday, February 20th. And certainly want to welcome all of you that are with us this evening. If we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. I'll ask Councilman Davis if he would lead us in the pledge. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Yes. Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Johnson. Councilmember Moffitt. Councilmember Reese. And Councilmember Shule. Uh, good evening. We have two recognitions that we want to make this evening. Uh, the first highlights our neighborhood spotlight uh, citizen of the month and tonight we're recognizing the Reverend Dr. Tammy Rodman if she would join me please again for some of you who may not know the neighborhood spotlight award is an opportunity for the city council in the city to recognize residents for work that they've done in their community. Uh, we do this each month. This is under the auspices of the Neighborhood Improvement Services Department. And this is a person that is uh, selected by their neighbors. Uh, Mrs. Mr. Reverend Dr. Tammy Rodman is a resident of Northeast Central Durham on Ash Street, in particular what we call Old East Northeast Durham. And she has been very instrumental in her community by opening her house for neighborhood children to provide summer meals, uh, providing a safe space for our neighbors, including providing emergency housing. Uh, she's led vigils with the Religious Coalition for a Nonviolent Durham, and she's been very instrumental in organizing and participating in city and neighborhood initiatives to improve her neighborhood. And certainly we were very much appreciative when we have uh, neighbors and residents such as Dr. Rodman to be involved in her neighborhood to the extent that she has, and more importantly, that she's been recognized by members of the community. And I'm going to ask if there are any your neighbors that are out if, in the audience, if you mind stand standing, yes, please. My whole family. Your whole family. Yeah, okay. Everybody, too. <laughs> okay. 
Well, let me read this award. It's the City of Durham Neighbor Spotlight Award. And this cer certificate is awarded to Reverend Dr. Tammy Rodman in recognition of valuable contributions to Ash Street in Old East Durham by opening her house for neighborhood children to provide summer meals, by providing a safe place, place for neighbors, including emergency housing, by leading vigils with the Religious Coalition for Nonviolent Durham, and as I said earlier, by organizing and participating in city and neighborhood initiatives to improve the community. And it's signed by Thomas J. Bonfield, our city manager, and myself, William Bill Bell, mayor of the city of Durham. I'm going to present this to Dr. Rodman and certainly offer the microphone for any comments that she might have. Thank you. Um, I'm usually a little camera shy, believe that or not. But I do uh, want to have just a, f a moment to say thank you, um, first and foremost, to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ because it is only because of our relationship, our love for each other, that I have the strength and the ability to do these things, um, to open up my heart and open up my home, to love and to give, and to try my best to be a blessing um, as I have been blessed. I also would like to thank my family for their support. This is a portion of my family, um, but I have a very huge and diverse family. My family looks like God's garden, and they are truly my brothers and sisters. Um, and so I would like to thank them for their support. They have supported me in so many ways. They have prayed with me. They have encouraged me. They have supported me with it, in just countless ways, they's, they've even at times um, cried with me. Um, so I want to thank them. And then I want to thank uh, Mayor Bell and the city of Durham for taking time to present awards such as this because there are many people who are in the trenches who are working who don't always get a spotlight and um, so this means a lot, especially when you're out there day in and day out, and sometimes you have those moments when you feel that nobody understands what you're doing and why you're doing it. And so thank you all for taking the time to do this. Continue to do this for people, and continue to help us to um, be that light in the community because each of us have a purpose and a plan, uh, and we need to do what we've been called to do, even if it's something that seems minor, hugging a child, offering an extra sandwich, um, sharing a coat. If you got five coats, and I don't know about most of us, but I know I've got more than one, think about giving one of them away. That's what God tells us to do. So whether you believe in God or whatever your faith is, I think faith, if we understand all of the many faiths, love seems to be a strand that runs through them all. So love somebody, okay? Thank you. Next, we would like to recognize the <coughs> National Collegiate Transition Month for the Durham Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Inc. And I'm going to ask Dr. Hester, who's the Social Action Committee Chair, if she would join me, along with Kelly D. Bage, the Collegiate Transition Task Force, and others that you may bring forth. How are you doing? This is it? Okay. Uh, the proclamation reads, where is Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated was founded January 13, 1913 on the campus of Howard University to promote academic excellence, to provide scholarships, to provide support to the underserved, to educate and stimulate participation, 
in the establishment of positive public policy to highlight issues and provide solutions for problems in their communities. Whereas Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated is a public service organization with over 1,000 chapters worldwide and has initiated over 200,000 women committed to service, leadership, and empowerment, whereas Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated is focused on the organization's five-point programmatic thrust, which includes educational development, economic development, physical and mental health, political awareness and involvement, and international awareness and involvement, whereas Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated's Collegiate Transition Task Force was established to address the retention rate of collegiate members and help increase the transitioning rate of collegiate members to the alumni chapters by connecting with an alumni chapter before they graduate. Whereas at the start of its establishment, the Collegiate Transition Task Force created a five-year plan to increase by 50% each year the number of graduating collegiate members to register with an alumni chapter prior to graduation and during February, National Collegiate Transition Month, collegiate members gain invaluable information about alumni chapters and life in Delta beyond collegiate years. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim February 2017 as National Collegiate Transition Month in the City of Durham and urge all citizens to join me in expressing appreciation to the Durham alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, Incorporated for the support of the community and as collegiate sorrows transition to an alumni chapter for contingent commitment to service, leadership, and empowerment beyond graduation from college. And with this in my hand, Corporate Seal of the City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the 20th day of February 2017, and I'm going to present this to you for any comments that you may have. And I, I would say that I think all of us are aware of the work that Delta Sigma Theta and its members do in this community and throughout the country, and we certainly are proud that we have the leadership here in Durham that you are so involved. For that, we're very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening, Honorable Mayor Bell and esteemed members of the City Council. My name is Tina Hester, Chair of Durham Alumni Social Action Committee, Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated, and co-sponsor of this event, Delta Days at the City Council. We also have Kelly Page, the other co-sponsor of this event, and chair of the Alumni Collegiate Exchange and Collegiate Transition Task Force. The sorority is especially honored to have our national second vice president, Ms. Taylor McCain, accompanying us this evening. Ad Thank you. Additionally, we are proud to bring you greetings on behalf of our regional director and one of Durham alumni's own, Ms. Juanita Massenburg, our president, Ms. Arvis Bridges Epps, and other officers and members of Durham Alumni Delta Sigma Theta Incorporated. Delta Sigma Theta Inc. is committed to taking an active interest in the welfare of our nation, state, and city by contributing ideas and providing oversight to the enactment of laws that protect all of us, and especially those who are less fortunate than we are. Further, we stand vigilant to guard against any actions that deprive individuals of their privileges and rights. Our attendance this evening commemorates National Collegiate Transition Task Force Month with the theme, Come and Grow With Us. To those ends, members of Durham Alumni, would you please stand? Come as supporters and not as adversaries, but as partners of hope. Thanks again for allowing us to observe Delta Days at the City, Ca City Council and for the beautiful proclamation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I believe Kelly Page might be related to uh, one of our most esteemed city staff members, <laughs> Ms. Wanda Page. Mr. Mayor, could I uh, recognize the presence of the wife of our first African-American mayor, Mr. Chester Jenkins, is with us. Ms. Leola Jenkins. Uh, that's my moment in black history. <laughs> Thank you. Let me ask her there. 
Comments by members of the council? No. Recognize Councilman Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to make sure everyone in the room and everyone watching at home or listening on the internet was aware that earlier today the Durham Performing Arts Center announced that in its 2018-2019 season, uh, Hamilton American Musical will be coming to the DPAC. It is an extraordinary show um, that uh, uses uh, modern uh, music, especially rap music, uh, to tell uh, a really great story about our founding fathers um, and also uh, casts people of color in the role of those founding fathers as a way to break down the barriers that separate uh, people today from the history that is still very much relevant today. Mr. Mayor, I know you know that politics is a tough business. Um, Alexander Hamilton was shot and killed by the sitting vice president of the United States. Um, uh, not the last time the sitting vice president of the United States shot someone, by the way, but that's another story. Um, I was really, really excited to see this. I went down, uh, I went down to the ticket uh, booth today, actually, and spoke to some of the folks that work there. Since the announcement was made at 11 a.m., their phones have been ringing off the hook uh, because the only way to make sure that you get tickets to see Hamilton in the next season of the DPAC uh, SunTrust Broadway series is to be a season ticket holder for the upcoming season, which also looks terrific, by the way, um, and then renew your membership next year. Uh, and so uh, as, we, uh, as we move into this renewal period for, uh, and sign-up period for season tickets for this year, I just wanted to make sure everyone knew uh, that uh, Hamilton, the American musical, is coming to Durham. Uh, so I just want to make sure the people of Durham do not throw away your shot. If you want to be in the room where it happens, make sure to sign up for season tickets this year, and, um, and, we'll, uh, and I'll see you down there for this season's shows as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Charlie. Uh, that that uh, is, is very, very much of a highlight of DPAC in spite of all the success that it's had. And um, I was hoping it was going to come to Durham in North Carolina first, but unfortunately it's going to Charlotte, but it's, it, it's then coming to Durham <laughs> after we do that. But that's, that's great, and I appreciate you. The, they'll be first, but we'll have it best, Mr. Mayor. I, 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 I hope we do, and I'm sure we will. Uh, are there other comments by members of the council? Yes, sir. I would like to congratulate the Kappas. The Kappas are your, are the Kappas your sweet? No, 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 excuse no, me. No, no. Uh, the Kappas for an event on uh, Saturday in which they were uplifting young black boys. And one of the speakers asked the question, uh, where is the press? And um, I think that we need to encourage the press to come to positive um, activities so that people can see the great things that our young black boys are doing. Thank you. Uh, are there other comments? If not, uh, I, I'm going to uh, read to the council and to the public uh, a letter that I've written. And it is a follow-up to discussion that the council had at our work session uh, last week or whenever the last work session was. And it's on HB2, the House Bill HB2. And some of you may or may not know that uh, we had a pretty lively discussion on the effort to repeal HB2 in a proposal that I suggested. And uh, that suggestion obviously did not pass. It was a tie vote among our city council people. But I, I respect the, the right of uh, my colleagues to vote however they choose to vote on whatever issue they choose to vote on. Uh, it's certainly their right, and I, I'm not questioning, I might not agree with it, but it's certainly a right that I, that I respect. And it's in that tone that I, I would hope that my colleagues would also respect the right that I have as the mayor of the city of Durham to uh, write a letter as I'm going to present to you all this evening and to the public. Uh, and the letter is written to Governor Roy Cooper, North Carolina Office of the Governor, to Senate Senator Phil Berger, President Pro Tem of the Senate, to Representative Tim Moore, the Speaker of the House of Representatives. And the subject is the proposed House Bill 2 compromise. And the letter reads, uh, Dear Governor, Senator Berger, and Representative Moore, as Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, I am writing to request that you repeal HB2. My appeal to you is based on basically two situations that have occurred since your last consideration of repealing House Bill 2 
during a special session in December 2016. And these two situations are as follows. Number one, we now know for certainty that the United States Supreme Court has scheduled oral arguments for GG versus Gloucester County School Board on March 28, 2017. A decision in that case may provide legal guidance regarding local discrimination, non-discrimination, ordinances in North Carolina. Therefore, if House Bill 2 is repealed in the near future, we will encourage our respective boards to wait to consider new local ordinances to after June when the GG decision is expected to come from the court. Now that was not known at the time when the special session was held in December 2016. This is new information that has occurred since that time. The second point is that we now know for some certainty that the NCAA and other athletic associations have made it clear that this repeal of House Bill 2 will be an important factor in determining whether or not they hold their tournaments in North Carolina, which could have had at least a five, could have at least a five-year impact on North Carolina, on its schools, primarily higher education, and its economy, the economy of North Carolina. Again, that's the second fact that was not known when it was discussed in the special session in December 2016. We all know that politics is about the art of compromise, trust and commitment in many political decision areas, and this is an important subject upon which to build the proposal. Additionally, as a part of this proposal, I would recommend that the North Carolina General Assembly impose a moratorium on localities establishing any anti-discrimination ordinances in opposition to the present ruling on HB2 for a period of six months after HB2 is repealed or until the United States Supreme Court has issued its ruling in GG versus Gloucester County School Board, whichever occurs first. As previously mentioned, oral arguments in that matter has been set for March 28, 2017. As a part of this compromise for repealing HB2, I'm encouraging my fellow colleagues who are mayors and are members of the North Carolina Metropolitan Mayor's Coalition, and for some of you who may or may not know, North Carolina Metropolitan Mayor's Coalition consists of mayors of the largest urban areas in the state of North Carolina, uh, about 28, and I presently am a member of that, that organization. And I would encourage our respective councils to wait to consider new local ordinances until after the six-month moratorium or when the GG decision is made by the U.S. Supreme Court, or whichever occurs first. Finally, we appreciate greatly the effort of all of you in attempting to resolve this issue in a timely manner. I would urge you to carefully consider this proposal as you continue to find a solution that is having an enormous impact on our state that we all love and for which we want the very best. And it's signed by me as the mayor of the city of Durham, I carbon copy Representative Darren G. Jackson, the House Democratic Leader. I carbon copy Senator Dan Blue, the Senate Democratic Leader. I copy members of my city council. I'm copying Thomas Bonfield, our city manager, Patrick Baker, our city attorney, and Ms. Julia White, who is the executive director of the North Carolina Metropolitan Mayor's Coalition, and would request on her to also send this letter to members of NCMMC. Now let me say for me, there really is no downside for the General Assembly repealing HB2 and establishing a moratorium for six months or how soon the court decision is made, which comes, comes quick first. There's no downside. Because if HB2 remains on the book, no matter how much we oppose HB2, and this council has gone on record early on as with a resolution requesting the General Assembly to respectfully repeal HB2, no matter how many persons who don't want HB2 and would like an anti-discrimination ordinance to be imposed by localities, as long as HB2 is on the books, we can't do that. No matter how much we want, 
or how much we care or where we are. We will never be able to do that as long as HB2 is on the books. So for me, there's no downside. The upside is if HB2 is repealed, then what, in my opinion, it may do is to at least take away the issue that we now have before us in terms of the economic impact HB2 is having on the state, the brand, and et cetera. Now, I don't know what the NCAA would do if the HB2 bill is repealed under these conditions, but it's pretty apparent to me that if it's not repealed, uh, they pretty much made it very clear that they are not going to have any of their tournaments in this state, and that could impact us for the next five years. And we don't know how many other organizations of similar status or companies are thinking the same thing about HB2. The upside is if it's repealed, then hopefully that will go away. In terms of timing, now somebody may say, well, you know, this is the same proposal that was turned down back in December. And I would say yes, with the exception of two things. One is that it's not just waiting until the moratorium is over. If the court decision comes before that, then it gives the state of North Carolina, hence localities, some guidance as to how they might act relative to anti-discrimination ordinances that affect and impact the LGBT community. The other thing is, as I said earlier, uh, we didn't know for sure what the NCAA was going to do in terms of the timing, but I think it's, they've made it very clear that they want to make a decision in March. And if this bill is still on the books in March, uh, I think we pretty much have certainty as to which direction that's going to go. And also it impacts the brand of, of our community. Now the, the General Assembly can do anything it wants. We know that. <laughs> they may accept this. They may not accept it. They may decide to do something else. But we don't have a vote on that. But I think it's important that at least they hear from some of the leaders of the cities of which they have concern as to where they are. And again, I'm speaking for the mayor of the city of Durham. I'm not speaking for my council. I mean, we, we've had a discussion on that, and we saw where that went. But the fact of the matter is, if it's repealed and the moratorium is in place, as I said, we're not going to be able to do anything anyway. The situation doesn't change. The only upside that I see, or the upside that I see, is that possibly the economic impact that we've been threatened with may potentially go away. Now, I'm not asking for any comments from my colleagues on this, on this matter. Again, this is a letter that I'm writing, and I have the privilege and the prerogative to write the letter. I'll, I'll hand it out to you. I'm going to make sure that it gets to the persons that have been uh, addressed on this, on this letter. We'll be mailing it tomorrow and email it to those persons, and we'll see where we go from there. But again, I just wanted to share this with you in, in a public way. And as I said, I will share the letter, and we will uh, wait whatever outcome there is to the letter. Uh, sure. I promise no more conversation about it. I just had a question about it. Um, <clears throat> when we uh, considered this matter a week and a half ago at our last work session, uh, the posture in which it was brought before us was as a motion to suspend the rules uh, to um, agree to the letter that you had proposed at that time, which is, is somewhat similar to the one you, you were going to write for yourself. Um, and as I recall, the vote uh, to suspend the rules was a tie, and therefore the rules were not suspended. Is it your intention to bring that matter back before us under the regular order so that we can no, act on it or not? It's, it's not my intention. In Thank fact, you, Mr. Mayor. In fact, if I, I have to speak to the city attorney, uh, I think that the uh, winning side of the argument would have to bring that specific motion back for us to discuss, to debate it, unless it's after a certain period of time. I'm not so sure that the, the losing side, and I was on the losing side, uh, would be able to bring this matter back before the council. But that, that to me, isn't important. It really isn't. It's up to the council if they want to bring it back up and discuss it. Again, this is a letter from the mayor of the city of Durham to the persons that I've addressed, and uh, I, I'm, I'm comfortable to leave it up to them. They may, they may very well come up with an entirely different proposal. We know the governor's been in discussion with uh, the leadership. Uh, from what I read in the newspaper, in the media, uh, the three-point proposal that he had presented, again, as I read and what I heard from the center leadership was not acceptable. But again, I don't know what's happening behind closed doors and what other kind of discussions are going on. I don't think my letter is going to have any negative impact on whatever discussions are going on. Uh, so I, I don't really see any need to have further discussion. But again, it's up to the council if, if you choose to do that. 
I don't know if that answered your question, Councilman Reese. You absolutely did, okay. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Sir. Does that, <clears throat> if we're off that subject, I want to recognize the presence of Dr. Benjamin and her students from UNC. Would you please stand? Dr. Benjamin, raise your hand since you look so much like a student yourself. I, I thought that was a student. I'll be Welcome. I thought she, she looks like a student. Yeah. Glad to have you. I ask other priority items first by the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. No priority items. Uh, likewise, the city attorney. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. And likewise, the city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. You said no? No items. I'm sorry. I have no items. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. I just didn't quite understand what you said. Okay, we'll proceed with the agenda as presented. Uh, again, there are... Uh, we have the consent agenda. The consent agenda may be passed with a single motion. Uh, if a member of the council or a member of the audience chooses to pull an item, uh, that item will be pulled and discussed later in the agenda. And I will just um, read the heading of each one of the agenda items. Under the consent agenda, item one, approval of city council minutes. Item two, the mayor's nominee for reappointment. Durham Performing Arts Center Oversight Committee. Item three, Durham Performing Arts Center Oversight Committee reappointment. <coughs> Item four, the street and infrastructure acceptances. Item five, request to amend the FY 2016-2017 budget and other grant and capital project ordinances. Item six, families moving forward, 2016-2017 CDBG funds and for grant comprehensive case management services. Item seven is change order number one, Brown and Williams water treatment plants expansion upgrades project. Item eight is small lift stations rehabilitation construction contract award to Gilbert Engineering Company. Item nine is construction services contract with Hockaday Mechanical Corporation for the Campus Hills pool dehumidification improvements project. Item 10 is the third Fork Creek Stream Restoration Construction Services Contract, SD 2016-03, a Professional Services Contract Amendment, SD 2013-03. Item 11 is Contract Amendment for Durham Downtown Loop Waterline Replacement Construction, Storm Drainage Repairs and Improvements. Item 12 is a Contract Amendment for Contract, SD 2015-02, Trenchless Pipe Repairs. Item 13 is Utility Petition Projects. Item 17 through 20 items that can be found on the general business agenda is a public hearing. Item 21 is the Museum of Durham History Board of Directors, City Council appointment. That concludes the consent agenda. I would entertain a motion on approval of consent agenda. So moved. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Uh, we move to the general business agenda public hearings. Item 17 is street closing of Nevada Avenue, Chester Springs Road, and Hickman Avenue. Good evening. Good evening, Kyle Taylor of the Planning Department. <clears throat> I can affirm that all legal notice requirements have been executed in accordance with state and local law for public hearing items 17 through 19 and affidavits for such or on file in the planning department. Antipressi proposes to close 15, I mean 1,505 linear feet of public right of way. The request compromises uh, portions of Nevada Avenue, Chester Springs Road, and Hickman Avenue. The right of way is currently dedicated and not opened. The portion of the streets requested for closure are bordered by property owned by B. Wallace Design and Construction LLC, Big Beckford NC LLC, and tri Triangle Residential Optics Options for Substantial Substance Abuse Inc. If the request is approved, the portions of these right-of-ways will be recombined with the adjacent property owners. 
staff recommends co council approve the permanent closure of 1,505 linear feet of these streets. Thank you, and staff is available for any questions. Uh, this is a public hearing. Uh, you've heard the staff report. I would ask first, are there comments by members of the council on this item? If not, we have one person that has signed to speak on this item, Annalise Kellner, and she says she was unsure if she's a proponent or opponent, so if you can come forward. Let me ask again, is, this is a public hearing, and I would ask, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item, either for or against? If not, if you could just state your name and address for the record, and you have three minutes with the clock. Uh, Annalise Kellner, 2355 Huron Street. I'd like to get some clarity as to where the ingress and egress is for this subdivision. So just as a point of clarification, this is for the street closing itself, which is separate from the actual subdivision. But to answer your question about the subdivision, which is going to be happening after this approval, if it is approved, that access is off of the, Nova, the existing Nevada Avenue um, intersection. And, and that intersects with Huron? Let me pull up my site plan real quick. That is correct. Okay. My concern is having lived on Huron for 13 years now, we've got a lot of um, very small houses, don't have garages, and a lot of on street parking. I'm concerned that the walkability um, is going to be compromised by more traffic. And that includes the fact that we also don't have sidewalks. And, well, some of us don't park so good. Uh, so the distance on the road all the way down, up and down here on, could be 12 feet to try to pass one more car. And with 14 houses being placed in there, I'm concerned that that's going to impact kids who are playing in the streets, riding the bikes, that sort of thing. That's it. You have a comment, Councilman Moffitt. Yeah, you know, I'm going to thank the Ms. citizen. Kellner. I just wanted to thank you for, for, you know, coming tonight. I wanted to say that um, there's an extensive amount of right-of-way that currently exists, including the same road connections to Huron, and um, the, the, the case tonight is to close part of that, but not all of it. So we could choose not to close it, but it wouldn't eliminate the connection to Huron Street. That is already in existence and has been for probably decades, but they're just seeking to close part of it. You're welcome. Did you have another question, Ms. Kellner? Could, 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 you, could you come to the microphone again, please? So will there be access in and out any other way than here on street? No. That's, that, the, uh, co uh, 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 that is what they're proposing, but that's not what we're talking about tonight, right? Okay. So what they've proposed is a, is, a, is a, as far as I know, my understanding is, is a cul-de-sac that'll have 14 houses on it instead of the, how many lots are currently platted there? Sarah Young with the planning department. There are currently 27 platted lots. So instead of the 27 lots that are currently platted, they would close some of the streets and turn that into 14 lots. Okay. So you know, maybe I'm wrong and I'm not really understanding, but if there are other egresses being closed, they would box that in so that only Huron Street would be in the in and out, right? So wouldn't that affect the closing of the streets? Right. Isn't that the topic tonight? Or am I mistaken? Sarah Young again, yes, that would limit this small subdivision to only being uh, the ingress and egress for it coming solely off of Huron. That is correct. Okay. So it does affect tonight's agenda item, yes? Right. Thanks. Okay. Right. Okay. Are there other persons that want to speak on this item, this item being a public hearing? If not, let the record reflect that no one else asks to speak on this item and the matter is back before the council. The matter being to recognize Councilman Moffitt. 
Yeah, when this case, when this came up five weeks ago, um, I was um, not very supportive of it for some of the same reasons that, um, that you were talking about. Uh, we strongly support connectivity uh, as much as we can uh, in, um, in developments and subdivisions, and uh, this limits the connectivity. I, it, it's a very difficult uh, for, at least in my understanding, it's very difficult for solid waste to get into the cul-de-sac and then be able to uh, maneuver and pick up the, the bins. But in looking into this a little bit further, um, it's my understanding that the, that the two major streets that would be closed um, are both basically built on creek beds. I mean, excuse me, not built on creek beds. They're laid out on creek beds. And that um, by not closing the street, then those creeks would have to be, my understanding, would have to be piped. And um, that is a fairly substantial amount of environmental degradation. So because they're limiting the number of lots and because of the environmental situation, I will be supportive of this tonight. It would it'd be lovely if it was a little bit easier on solid waste, but I'm going to be supportive of it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I appreciate your concern, and um, it's certainly legitimate, uh, but I do think that this is a good uh, development. I think that the housing will be very nice, and the um, and there won't there will only be 14 units, and so there won't be a whole lot more traffic on Huron. I I agree with you that I've been on Huron many times, and I agree it is a it is a narrow street, and there are cars parked there. But I don't think that um, I don't think this will have any significant negative impact on the street in terms of traffic. I live on Club Boulevard. We have in the corner of Club in Carolina. We have much much more traffic than that, and adding 14 houses I think will add very little so and I think in a lot of ways this is uh, a really good thing because we need more housing in the city of Durham um, and uh, I think that this is a good infill development it's a place where it's really good to have more housing and so I'll be supporting it I also want to also again say appreciate the neighborhood and the developer having a discussion about this in the last few weeks I think that was also really positive and thank you so much are there further discussion? Recognize the mayor pro tem. Um, I would just like to ask uh, the speaker if she attended the meeting with the other neighbors, uh, with the developer. Oh, okay. Because we received an email from that group stating that they were no longer opposed to it. I didn't know if you were there or not. Thank you. Move well, the item, Mr. Mayor. Oh, you have to close. Uh, you have to close the public hearing. hearing. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We'll move on to item 18. Zoning map change for Zovin Revision. Thank you. Jacob Wiggins with the Planning Department. This is a um, request from the Durham City County Planning Department to change the zoning designation of nine parcels generally located at 1303 Wren Road. Um, the site is currently zoned plan development residential 4.840 and the proposed zoning de designation is the same PDR 4.840. Um, the current designation was established by the Durham County Board of Commissioners in 2006 and the site was annexed into the city of Durham effective September 30th, 2014. The only proposed change with this rezoning is the removal of text commitment number eight um, on the active development plan. That text commitment states that at the time of the building permit, the applicant shall pay a voluntary school impact fee of $1,000 per lot, or excuse me, per single family lot, and $300 per multifamily unit with credit given appropriate against any other impact fees which may have been in place. Um, the request to remove this commitment is required by settlement agreement between the City of Durham, the City County Planning Department, the Durham Board of Education, and the property owner. No other modifications to the previously approved PR are proposed through this request. 
Um, staff recommends that the council approve the requested rezoning and the adopt a consistency statement. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Okay, you've heard the staff report. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I would ask first, are there comments, questions by members of the council? Hearing none, I would ask, is it anyone in the audience that has not signed up to speak on this item that would like to speak? This is item 18, zoning map change. Is there anyone that wants to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the public asked to speak on this item, either for or against. I will declare the public going to be closed. Madam Speaker, before council. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Let's close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We'll move on to item 20, item 19, zoning map change for Creekside Commons. Excuse me, Mary Bell. Um, the council also needs to consistency adopt a consistency statement. statement. Thank you. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. We'll now move to item 19, zoning map change for Creekside Commons. Good evening again. Kyle Taylor with the Planning Department. <clears throat> zoning case Z16-00001. Creekside's Commons is a zoning map change request for 26.461 acres. The subject site is presently zoned residential suburban 20 with the future land use designation of low medium density residential, four to eight dwelling units per acre, and is located in the suburban tier. The applicant proposes a zoning designation of planning development residential 5.000. Development plan associated with this request graphically commits to the following, general location of site access points, location of building and parking envelope, location of tree preservation areas. Text commitments have been proffered. A complete list of these text commitments can be found in the staff report or in the cover page of the development plan. A few of the proffered commitments require that a, one, a 110 foot right of way be dedicated, the installation of speed humps, that a crosswalk be provided across Ephesus Church Road and all dwelling units shall be townhomes. Staff determined this request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and other adopted plans and policies. Thank you and staff is available for any questions. Again, this is a public hearing. The public hearing is open. I would ask first again from members of the council if you have comments or questions. Uh, hearing none from the council, we're going to the public. I have four persons that have signed up to speak in support of this item and two have signed up to speak in opposition. Uh, let's have 12 minutes on this item first. Uh, I recognize the proponents. Uh, I have Isaac Woods, Ken Spaulding, George Sanciel, Andrew Boyer. Now, is there anyone else that wanted to speak in support of this item uh, did, not sign, did not sign up? Uh, that being the case, we'll go with the proponents of the development first. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. My name is Ken Spaulding. I represent the applicant in this matter. Uh, this rezoning, as was pointed out, we uh, actually meet all of the rules, regulations, policies, and a comprehensive plan uh, for this area. Uh, we have met with the neighbors over a period of time, and we had worked extremely hard to try to meet their substantial uh, issues that they had raised with us. One of the important things was density. We've been able to reduce uh, the density was previously at 6.3 units an acre. We've reduced it to five units an acre. Uh, that is actually a hundred, from 169 townhomes to 132. Uh, we deferred and continued the planning commission meeting in order to get that done, and we met with the neighbors, and we accomplished that. I also want to point out that uh, key issues had to do with traffic traffic on Farrington Road and traffic on Ephesus uh, Chapel Road. On Ephesus Chapel Road, we're talking about significant traffic in particular at the time of uh, going to school and going, leaving school. And the important thing is our project is right in front of Creekside Elementary School. And so what we did, we went and we met with the uh, uh, Hugh Osteen, or Robert did, and uh, of the school system and talked with them about the uh, traffic there. Also found that uh, they, were, they didn't have traffic guards there most of the time. 
and we suggested that that be done based on the traffic. Uh, the neighbors felt that would be a, a, a help. Uh, we also pointed out that uh, uh, we were going to do a crossing walk there, uh, which the school system thought was a good idea. I want to point out that uh, the other area is uh, the current problem of Farrington Road. I think you all recall when we passed the Wood Partners uh, uh, project that I represented among, we were able to get substantial changes uh, for 54 and Farrington Road, which will help to alleviate some of the traffic concerns that are there today. That's the current situation. Now, for future, uh, what we're going to be trying to do is to be able to uh, give or dedicate the right of way for what would be the Southwest Durham uh, Parkway, which is the George King Road. Uh, we're going all across our property, we're going to actually dedicate that right of way for it. So that will help to serve, hopefully, as an impetus uh, for uh, future. Uh, revenues for that, uh, future con uh, uh, contributions by the city and by the state to see that that gets done. Uh, that's important to be done because it will alleviate significant traffic off of Farrington Road. So we're a part of a, hopefully a solution to this. Uh, we went in front of the Planning Commission and after they had deliberated over it, we had a 12 to 0 vote in favor of it. We're here tonight and George Stanziel will deal with more specifics of the project. We would greatly appreciate and respectfully request your support for this project. Thank you. Uh, good evening, um, Mr. Mayor, members of council. George Stanziel, 115 Cofield Circle in Durham. Um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll try to be as quick as possible. Some of it will be um, uh, some repeat, but I do want to read these into the, um, into the record. As Mr. Spaulding uh, pointed out, we have met a number of times with, uh, with neighbors, both formally and informally. Um, we've been to planning commission twice. As a result, we've reduced our project from 6.3 uh, units per acre to 5.0 units per acre, which was requested directly by the neighbors uh, at the first planning commission meeting. We've reduced the number of units from 169 to 132 units, reducing impact on traffic and schools. Uh, I wanted to point out a, uh, a quote from Planning Commissioner Tom Miller. The project, as proposed, now makes a more successful and appropriate transition between the areas designated for low-density residential development and the area marked for low-medium uh, density development on the flume. The wide buffer between the project, which is 200 feet, uh, and, the <coughs> and the neighboring single-family home subdivision mitigates any potential tension that might be caused by the change in building form between detached single-family homes and multifamily uh, townhome buildings. Uh, he goes on to talk about the fact that what we've done, the density, uh, the commitments we've made uh, meets um, many of the uh, all of the uh, uh, policies of the comp plan. We've committed to townhomes only. That was a request by the, by the neighbors. Um, and that was to help mitigate traffic um, as well as uh, school, uh, impact on schools. The traffic generated uh, here is less than it would be at four units per acre, which is the low end of the four to eight units per acre in the comp plan. The traffic generated by our proposed development over the existing zoning, which is R20, adds only 264 cars over a 24-hour period. The current R20 district could be developed by right with a site plan and no committed elements. Um, we are also dedicating 1.8 acres. Uh, for George King Parkway, as Mr. P uh, Spaulding po uh, pointed out, which bifurcates our, our site um, and, uh, and essentially makes it a little more difficult to master plan it from an uh, efficiency perspective. We are committing to 5.4 acres of tree cover, and we are committing to architectural standards related to materials, colors, building setbacks, uh, and building setbacks as requested um, by the Planning Commission. 
uh, I noted that there is a 200 foot buffer that runs between the existing neighborhood along the entire western portion of our site, um, which will remain as a required buffer for a stream buffer. Um, when we spoke with Mr. Osteen, um, he made a comment to us that he encourages density adjacent to schools because in his estimation, it reduces the need for buses. Um, however, our proposed development has no impact on schools. In fact, uh, based on the current zoning of R20, it actually reduces the impact on schools by four students. We are adding a crosswalk from our project to the, to the school. Um, and I wanted to point out that this site lies uh, within 0.8 miles in two different directions to two different transit stations, proposed transit stations. And if we believe in transit, um, we, we know that transit will not be funded federally if we, if we have areas within those, those one mile uh, districts that are uh, at low densities. This is pretty low density, honestly. For transit, you're really looking at as much as 24 units an acre. So this is pretty low density, and we want to make sure that we support these transit areas. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, Mr. Andrew Boyer or Isaac Woods, whichever one wants to speak. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. My name is Isaac Woods. I reside at 5223 Ephesus Church Road. That property is located and adjacent to the property that you're considering rezoning. We're here on behalf of the Jones family and the Woods family in support of this project. This has been pro property that's been in my family that my great great uncle purchased when he was released from slavery and purchased it doing caulkwood, that's called lumberjacking now. We take our hats off to this developer and what they have is simplified as an excellent record the developers need when they come into a community. They reached out to us, if you heard, they've had meetings, they reached out to us and said, what do you want? How can we be productive to make this a better community? Now you don't hear too many developers coming in asking how to make it a better community. But this developer set a pattern and a tone that every developer should need to follow. They've met with us, they asked us what we wanted, how to reduce the traffic, how to reduce the, the school system, and we all met, and as you heard, we met more than one time. And one time they were 6.3, now they're at 5.0, they're putting on a crosswalk. And this is a project that we support and we think it makes the city better and it improves the neighborhood. And it supports the land use that we were here years ago, about 15, 20 years ago when we developed the land use map for the property in there. And we ask that you approve this project. We were here when you built and rezoned for Creekside. We didn't get that type of respect for the developer of Creekside. They didn't meet with us. But this developer has taken their hat off and it would be a shame for you to turn down this rezoning request as a slap in the face of this developer with the type of expertise, community activeness, and support that they've given every citizen there. There's nobody that's going to be impacted by this subdivision other than my family. We're adjacent to it. We've been there before. We had uh, commons and all the rest of the development. we all been there. We dealt with the traffic. We do not feel like it's a traffic problem. We feel like they worked out a solution. We look forward to the transit there. And we look forward to being a better community for everyone there. And we ask that you support this project and give this developer a hands off for the type of example that every developer in Durham County needs to set. Thank you for your time. Could, could I ask you a question, please? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, are you on city water and sewer in your development now? Uh, no, we, we have water, but we don't have sewer. Would this development allow that to happen? Yes, yes, this development will allow us to have sewer. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you. Uh, recognize uh, Andrew Boyer. Oh, I'm sorry. You sure did. I had you on 24. I'm sorry. 
Okay, is it, that concludes the persons that have signed up to speak on item 19 in support of it. I'm going to recognize now the persons who have signed up to speak as opponents. Uh, first is Adam Jury and Ted Sozinski. Sozinski? I know I baffled that, but. but a short presentation. Uh, I'd like to. Get your name and address, please. Uh, my name is Adam Jury. I live at 3 Wesley Wood Drive in Durham. Thank you. Um, Give them the same amount of time they've gave them. Okay, is that all set? All right. Okay, thank you, uh, members of City Council, Mayor Bell. Um, I just wanted to give kind of an executive overview of where we've come from on this uh, uh, development, and uh, I appreciate the comments made by the, the developer as well. Uh, initially, we were opposed to density. We, um, we did ask for a decrease to five units per acre. Uh, there were several different citations, and and we do believe that the developer has come to meet us on that. We appreciate that. Um, so we uh, agree that that issue has been resolved. Um, the second uh, issue that we talked about was school overcrowding. Um, this is an issue because all of the entire fifth grade, as you see, is, uh, is housed in trailers. And part of the actual uh, city ordinance um, states that the uh, quality of education cannot be matched with temporary housing or buildings uh, versus a permanent facility. And so uh, right now Creekside is, is well um, uh, over, uh, overpopulated with kids. Uh, the capacity is, is uh, at least 900 students and um, it's only slated to get more even if it's uh, going to be uh, a, a smaller impact from the, the proposed developer. So this issue um, still remains unresolved. Um, and the traffic side, um, they did acknowledge the traffic issue. I think that uh, anybody who drives through the Southwest Durham on the morning times uh, and, e and afternoon times when school is let out at Creekside can uh, acknowledge the fact that sometimes you have to wait five to six light cycles at the intersection of Farrington Road and 54 to get through. Um, this uh, issue is really not going to get any better with the added traffic. so. Uh, this issue unfortunately also remains unresolved and I think uh, probably tabled for another larger discussion about um, uh, this growth in southwest, uh, southwest Durham in general. Uh, this was uh, an issue that we brought up last time was that um, the traffic volumes that they stated in the calculations for the planning department were based off of a two, 2013 study and Weston Downs was completed in, in 2013, and that has added considerable traffic to both Ephesus, Ephesus Church as well as um, uh, Farrington Road. And uh, so we believe that these numbers are, are likely to be understated at this time. And um, the, the other point worth mentioning is that the assumed use is uh, 50 single lots, single family lots, um, and that's where you get kind of the delta between these two to be 264. However, there's only two actual homes on this lot right now, so if you actually assess the actual impact on the uh, community, it's basically the full 800 cars. Um, and although the developer cannot be legally bound by that, but that is the actual community impact. So the traffic will get uh, very much worse once this development gets in. So this issue remains unresolved. Um, but the one point that I really want to focus on today, because I believe that we can do something about this, is the, uh, the situation of pedestrian safety um, with the kids crossing Ephesus Church Road every day to go to school. Um, as they mentioned, um, the, uh, uh, Mr. Osteen with, with the uh, Board of Education said that he prefers to have a higher density near the school but the school policy is actually that they can't cross without um, an adult. And so having a crosswalk there may not actually do any good without somebody to walk them across. And as you can see here, currently there's a kind of a rotation of, 
of families that walk kids across um, in large groups, and right now they, they've reported to me that it's very hard a lot of the times to get traffic to stop on uh, Ephesus Church Road because there's no signals, there's just a crosswalk, and a lot of times people are just waving their arms trying to get uh, traffic to stop on that road, and that's as it is right now. So you add a lot of cars. Here this is the intersection where the uh, Ephesus Church, where the school entrance is and so this is a typical morning here you've got lots of cars coming in and out this is coincidentally also exactly where they want to put the um, uh, the crosswalk and now you also have added another layer of competing left turns um, so you have left turns coming out of the driveway you have left turns coming in which as you saw the majority of these people are trying to make that left in from the, the 40 uh, i-40 direction and now you have most of the people who are going to make making a left to I-40 out of this development to go to work. And now you have all these uh, uh, influences right there at this intersection, and it's bound to be a really tremendous problem, I think, once the development gets built. Uh, and granted, they did provide for an easement across uh, their property for Southwest Durham Drive, but um, as uh, I believe it was uh, uh, the same gentleman from the Planning Commission that he cited, um, Tom Miller, who said that the funding for that is not available and it will be possibly 20, 30 years off before that actually gets built. And so this is a long-term issue that will have to be dealt with in the community. So um, really what can we do to improve the pedestrian safety? And that's, that's what we're here to kind of question and ask for your guidance as to what the best scenario is. Um, really what we would we think may help would be a, uh, a lighted pedestrian sign uh, where this crosswalk is, um, maybe even a full traffic light at the tra crosswalk, um, the possibility of a, a traffic study to really understand um, uh, where the, exactly the best place for this crossing is. Is it right here with all the rest of the traffic? Is it over here? And put the light up there for the future of Southwest Durham Drive that comes across here. I'm not a traffic engineer. I don't know these answers. but. Um, right now we have a, a major development going in and it's going to create a major problem for the community, um, especially at the school crossing. So um, that's, uh, that's pretty much where we're at tonight is hopefully we get um, something uh, offered by the, uh, uh, the developer to improve the crosswalk situation, possibly a, uh, a study done to really understand uh, where the proper uh, light should be placed or any other safety features for kids crossing the road there um, because although there uh, there really are no kids from this development because there's only two houses there there's going to be a lot more um, I think that having a development there will be very attractive for families and uh, there may actually be more kids than is calculated based on the standards in the Durham uh, uh, Planning Department so I believe that there would be a greater issue than is really perceived to be in the future with kids crossing the road. So um, that is all I have, and uh, I'll pass it on now to Ted. I, I want to come back to that, um, to this point here, but I, I, I'll wait to hear the next speaker. I, I, I'm sorry, recognize yes. the Mayor Pro Tem and Councilman Reese. Yes, I, I have a question for Mr. Jury okay. real quick. Okay. Um, Adam, <coughs> I hate to do this, but you signed up to speak in opposition and that you didn't say you opposed the development. Can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, uh, I, in general, we are not opposed to uh, uh, development. I, I think that, you know, I live in Weston Downs. That was a development that was, you know, an infill development right there. So I think it's it just we need to understand how to develop in the right way to minimize the impacts on the community. Um, and also in a situation like this where it might actually have uh, a, a greater impact on situations like kids actually crossing the road, uh, I think it really behooves us to, to take a step back and see, you know, is there something extra we should be doing and are the standards really reflecting such a situation? And uh, in this case, I don't believe they are. And so I am opposed to, to the, uh, um, the development as it is right now and I'm hopeful that we can pull together with some adjustments to uh, to accommodate the school crossing issue. You had a question? Yeah. Sir, I decided I would ask you now. <laughs> <laughs> Did you discuss your concerns with the team 
Uh, yes, we did. I was present for most of those meetings, and we did discuss that. Um, in fact, they did uh, offer at one point a lighted crossing sign. So I, that's why I'm really kind of hopeful that that's still on the table. Um, I would also actually you bring up a good point. There is a, a list of text commitment suggestions in here by the Bicycle Commission, and one of them is a, uh, a median refuge island with uh, in the crosswalk. I think that would be a fantastic addition as well for the, the kids crossing the road there. Um, as well as the rest of their text commitments. So I wasn't sure if we would be able to add any text commitments, but there was a whole list of them that were requested anyway, okay. and uh, maybe that's possible. Yeah, you answered my question. Thank you. I'll ask a question uh, since we've opened it up. <laughs> I guess what's apparent to me, independent of the development, is the discussion, or have you had a discussion with the school system? I mean, it seems to me a simple matter is having a crossing guard there. I don't know what, what it, what it costs, I mean, but doing hours the school is opening and closing, uh, has that been discussed? It was brought up actually by the developer as a possible solution, um, but it would be paid by the HOA fees of the development. Um, we really didn't feel comfortable that that was gonna be sustained long-term because once the developer goes in, uh, well, I don't think that was ever given really uh, a lot of thought on your side. It was something that Britt had kind of thrown out in passing, but, um, you know, whether or not there is a school guard, that crossing guard that can be put there, I think that would be, you know, another uh, good thing to consider. Um, right now, uh, I don't think that there is a real uh, well thought out process, I'd say, for implementing the school crossing guard there at Creekside because the number of kids are, um, you know, is, is maybe not enough at this point in time, or I'm not sure what the reasons why um, they haven't put a school crossing guard there. Okay, I, I want to follow that up, but uh, I'll move to the next speaker now. Okay. I ask you to pronounce your name, because I know I screwed it up, so. Uh, Ted Sozensky, 5314 okay. Weston Downs Drive, Durham. Uh, I'm gonna speak about the stormwater problem that we have and how it's gonna get a little bit worse with the additional water from Creekside Commons. And um, I would like to see hopefully major improvements in how we handle stormwater. This is an overview showing Weston Downs and Marina Place. And you'll see there's a little blue line going off to the upper right to a pond. That, that's, a, that's a creek that runs adjacent to uh, Weston Downs and the Creekside Commons development. Also Clark Lake feeds into this pond and the output of that pond continues east and starts going south and intersects with New Hope Creek. And New Hope Creek goes all the way to Lake Jordan. Uh, this is the lower part of Weston Downs and Marina Place where the water for, all, for this creek starts. We get water from underneath Ephesus Church, it's probably street water, and we get water down the slope from Marina Place. This, this is the erosion coming from Marina Place. You can see the back of a house that faces Marina Drive. So there's already uh, erosion here, a tree in jeopardy. That water combines with the water from Ephesus Church, the overflow from our retention pond goes underneath um, Weston Downs Drive. And this is probably the official start of the creek. And you can see how severely undercut this is. The lower level is probably four to five feet from the surface. This creek continues north and east. Um, show you some pictures of erosion coming from Weston Downs. Uh, we have gullying and more gullying. And um, storm, <coughs> storm water erosion is an issue that we, the residents of nearby areas, have been learning about since we received notice of the proposed development of Creekside Commons. Our neighborhoods have been involved in a crash course on development issues. We have been investigating storm water and its consequences of erosion and silting and have come to learn that the storm water ordinances in Durham are inadequate. If we look at the other side of the creek, what's coming down from what's 
probably going to be Creekside Commons, you'll see there's an open area, and a little farther north there's a forested area. In the open area, you can see the cut land in the back, uh, more gullies, more gullies, uh, silting in the creek. Now if we go a little farther north, this is looking up into the forested area, and you can see there, there's no erosion here. Uh, when rain falls on a forest, it lands first on the upper canopy, then makes its way slowly to the ground with minimal erosion energy, allowing time for absorption. The tree leaves, brush, grasses, and decaying matter hold the water rather than let it run off and create problems. Our creek eventually winds up into a pond in um, Five Oak subdivision. And you can see the difference between that pond and Clark Lake. Clark Lake is nice, green, healthy, and uh, the erosion in the pond. The top of that pond leaves and, and heads out to Lake Jordan via New Hope Creek. When you get to Lake Jordan, you can see the massive amount of silting, but what you can't see is the nitrogen and phosphorus this is bringing into the creek. We're all quite familiar with the problems in Lake Jordan with the machines that they had out there, the solar bees. This is a quote from the uh, United States Army Corps of Engineers from their technical bulletin. Historically, stormwater has been managed using the flood control approach, where excess stormwater runoff is conveyed through a developed network of channels and pipes downstream to a central treatment outlet. This centralized approach is outdated, expensive to maintain, and only moderately effective as a pollution control measure. <coughs> Numerous case studies and research have indicated that stormwater management strategies should become decentralized and stormwater control measures should focus on mimicking an area's pre-development hydrology in an effort to lower downstream pollution. Um, I guess I'm up. Thank you. I want to congratulate you for your presentation. I don't know how it's going to affect the ruling, but I appreciate the educational piece about it. Recognize Charlie Reese. Hi there, Mr. Sosinski. I wanted to ask you, first of all, you did have done a great job in your crash course. You've learned an amazing amount about um, storm water and uh, those types of issues. Uh, I'm assuming this is all since the last Planning Commission meeting. Is that right? Uh, most of it, yes. Okay. Because I, I watched that when I didn't hear these issues raised, so I wasn't sure. That, that's why I said that was a really, really fast learning curve. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the why uh, erosion and uh, gullyization, as I believe you said in your letter, um, implicates the, this particular development? Like why, why is this development that you're, the rezoning that you're talking about, why, is the, why are those two issues important when considering this particular development? Well, there are already existing gullies from the um, open area, and uh, I don't know what's going to happen farther north where the trees are. Um, this is more of a, there, there's definitely going to be some water coming from Creekside Commons, and this is our chance to uh, do a good job in, in controlling it as best we can. Um, what are your specific concerns about how the developer has proposed to address the stormwater issues on the site? I don't know what he's doing. Yeah. Response to the question, what did he say? He said he didn't know. Oh, you didn't know? Okay. Appreciate your honesty. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. Are, are there other questions by members of the council? Recognize Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate your presentations they were both excellent um, so I guess I, I, my question is for the developer uh, is that appropriate at this time Mr. Mayor I have a couple different questions so I'll start with a stormwater question uh, how are you planning to treat the stormwater and what uh, what are the plans and uh, can you talk about that a little bit uh, Mr. Shul and members of the council, uh, I'll let George answer that if this is not enough. But let me just say that uh, Durham has some of the strictest uh, stormwater regulations in the, in the state. I think you all are aware of that. Uh, number two, uh, we're going to have a detention pond uh, in which, excuse me, several detention ponds, which uh, basically what they do is they hold the water. Right now, what would happen if you had a big rain it would just flood right off. And what we're going to have here are several detention ponds which will actually 
catch that rain, hold it, and let it off in an engineeringly design, engineeringly designed manner, uh, and 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 pace it. Uh, but it will hold it there. Will help clean it as it sifts through, and then they let it off in a gradual way versus what happens uh, today. So I I think that, and and I appreciate we this didn't come up in our meeting that I recall, but I'm glad you brought it up so we would have a chance to explain exactly how it's done and this is the way it's been done. Uh, this Durham is pretty much known as, as one of the strictest in that area. Now, you engineers can correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I, I don't want to mis mislead anybody in thinking that I'm an engineer, because I'm not, I'm a landscape architect. But under uh, the laws of North Carolina, landscape architects can also deal with stormwater. Um, and just to, to answer your question specifically, we, we will be required to collect, there's, there's two levels here. We, we have to collect uh, runoff from the first, from the fr one year storm. That has to be collected, it has to be held in a, in a detention facility that you see everywhere. Um, it's held, it's the water is cleaned, and it's, and it's released at a rate that is less than or equal to pre-existing runoff rates. So we can't increase that, we can't increase that runoff. The second level is that they look at, we look at the two and ten year storm. And that's really looking at downstream. That's looking, that, that's a study that looks at, at erosion downstream. And if, if that study uh, indicates that the flow would cause erosion downstream, then the, the detention ponds that Robert was talking about would then have to be designed to hold more water and release it at an engineered rate. So, you know, this is not something we typically get into in specifics in a zoning. We have, we do have extremely difficult and, um, uh, you know, as I understand it, you know, probably as difficult or close to as difficult rules as the state of Maryland, <laughs> which is extremely difficult. So, I, you know, that's the only thing that we can say at this point in terms of how we will deal with stormwater. Thank you. Um, sir, and I'm sorry I didn't catch your name. Can you tell me your name again? Uh, Ted Solzinski. Solzinski, Mr. Solzinski. There is a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of debate of people who think a lot about stormwater about what the best practices are. And you're right, they're low impact development. Uh, can have different kinds of stormwater practices that really will be good. And there's a lot of that work going on in the city of Durham, rain gardens, and the city of Durham itself is doing a very large uh, stormwater facility uh, at the bottom of Trinity Avenue that will service a lot of downtown. And so there's a lot of different kinds of innovations and innovative thinking about stormwater, and you're right about that. Uh, but these, these are our ordinances, and the way these stormwater ordinances work is that uh, this developer will have to have its stormwater plan approved by the city stormwater department, assuming this, th this development goes forward, and they will have to meet our standards. And so I hear you when you say it's not the best practices, and I understand that there are debates about that, but these are our standards, and they are, I think that they are pretty strong, pretty stringent standards. So I appreciate your concern, but I do think it's something that, I do think they are standards that developer will be, I know the their standards the developer will be asked to meet, and I think they can do a good job treating the stormwater from this development. Um, on the question of school overcrowding, I, I think that that is, I understand that that's a, uh, a concern for the school, but I'm not sure how it really is a concern, Mr. Jury, for this development. Uh, that is to say, uh, the schools are gonna have to make a decision over time about how many students are gonna be there, they're already in an overcrowded situation, and my expectation would be that they were going to be changing attendance. There are, I know the school systems are looking at a changing attendance zones, and I, my expectation is that I'm sure that this will be one of the schools where that zone has changed. So I hear you. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, the traffic on Ephesus in this part of town is, it, you know, it's legendary. Um, I'm appreciative of this problem. And uh, 54, uh, you know, this whole area is problematic. You're right that the improvements for this area in terms of roads are, are a ways away, years away. Um, let me just say that one thing, hopefully it is not as many years away, that I think has a better chance of anything else of reducing this traffic, at least on the 54 corridor, is the light rail. Uh, and um, I hope and expect that in a dozen years, which is what it'll take, uh, that that will be alleviating traffic. But you're absolutely right. The traffic there is problematic, and especially at the rush hours. Um, and this will add, uh, this will add cars, for sure. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's not adding, um, you know, so, so it's adding cars over time. I think I don't have it right in front of me, 260 some trips per day. Um, not, an, not, an, not nothing, but over 12 hours doesn't seem to be a tremendous addition to the traffic there, especially because the main problem that I've seen in the traffic there is at the rush hour times and when school is, is coming in. I'm really very sympathetic to the problem of the crosswalk, and um, I have previously discussed with the developers the possibility of a stoplight, and it was their estimate that there would not be, that they, it would not meet the qualifications for the stoplight at this time, but um, I am interested, and in maybe Mr. Judge or someone from transportation could talk to us about the possibility of a, a lighted crosswalk, uh, and uh, because I, am agr I agree with you very much that that's very problematic there. So I'm just wondering what our possible solutions are, Mr. Judge, and if you could comment on that. Yes, uh, Bill Judge with the City of Durham Department of Transportation. Um, it, yeah, it's unlikely that the um, proposed driveway and uh, school driveway intersection would ever meet warrants for a traffic signal. I think long-term solution, the more likely place where a potential traffic signal would be would be with the extension of Southwest Durham Drive and George King and those improvements, that intersection um, at some point would probably meet signal warrants, but that's not any time within the development time frame of this development as currently proposed. Um, there, uh, there are measures to, to provide warning signs or flashing warning, uh, warning lights at, at crosswalks um, that, that could potentially be done um, at this location. Um, sort of subject. It is a state maintained road, so anything that got in, installed would have to be subject to their approval. Would that, would that be the kind of, how would something like that occur, Mr. Judge? Would it be that, uh, would that be something that the city proposed to the state? Is that something that the developer would have a role in? How would something like that happen? Um, yes, it could be handled uh, a number of ways. Um, it could be a proffer of the development, um, similar to the crosswalk was proffered. Um, short of that, um, if the development's not approved or if it goes forward without any sort of uh, proffer, we could, uh, through a request of our department to the state, we could, we could investigate that or through a, either the school or the citizens. Thank you. So would it be appropriate then to ask the developer of you all's interest in proffering anything on that uh, crosswalk? Uh, yes, we um, I talked with my client about it uh, earlier today, uh, as I had heard more about this. And yes, it will, it can be proffered. I think that George and I talked about it Friday, and they've sent over the language to the city, but George can read it into the record, and we will voluntarily uh, proffer that in a committed element. George. Yes, yeah, so we um, vetted this um, with the transportation department, um, and it reads, subject, uh, so this is an additional committed element, subject to the review and approval by NCDOT and the city of Durham, the developer shall install two flashing pedestrian crosswalk signs along Ephesus Church Road on each side of the proposed project entrance per NCDOT and city of Durham standards prior to the issue issuance of the first certificate of occupancy. Thank you, and that's been vetted through our transportation yes. department. Yes, sir. Mr. Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stanzial, um, may I also ask you, um, 
have you all considered a uh, proper donation to the city's affordable housing fund? We have, and uh, the developer voluntarily proffers uh, an amount, I think, for you all's fund, amount of $35,000, and we can read it into the record, and that has been cleared uh, with staff as well. Um, the um, committed element will read, the developer shall provide a one-time donation to the City of Durham's Affordable Housing Fund <clears throat> in the amount of $35,000. The payment shall be made prior to the final plat approval. And this, is, this was also vetted with the planning department. Thank you very much. I don't have any more questions, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate it. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a couple of questions for staff. Um, in the Planning Commission notes, they, they noted a commitment of two to six units in a building. The design commitments say no more than six. Does townhouse mean at least two in a building? Let the record show that the nod headed yes. <laughs> Sarah Young, uh, by ordinance, three or more units is a townhouse, two would just be a duplex, which is one of the reasons we uh, spoke with them about uh, clarifying right. that. Okay, so, so the fact that they've, they've proffered only townhomes means three to six, given all the different commitments. Okay. And um, also, uh, the citizens spoke about the traffic impacts of the current use, and the staff report always uh, gives the current zoning. Can uh, can we just get some clarification for uh, some edification on why the, uh, the staff report indicates the impacts for the current zoning as opposed to the current use? So we always use the most intensive use based on the current zoning uh, because that is what they could apply for with a site plan by right. Right. So they could build, they could build it out at RS-20 and those impacts that you're indicating. That's the, Second, um, somebody raised a question about whether or not, like how those uh, student impacts, traffic impacts are calculated. Can you talk just briefly about how those, where those numbers come from? Yo, we, yeah. Um, so I may need some a little backup assistance with this one. However, generally speaking, they're based on a system-wide uh, approach, so they're not based on individual uh, school districts. They're based on calculations broken down by the type of use so whether it's based on single-family townhomes, uh, apartments, or another use, commercial, et cetera, they're based on that number and how many students are likely to be generated based on an existing calculation. And, and so those are, I don't want to say unique to Durham, but those are based on Dur calculations made on what's going on in Durham in, within the school system? Correct. We work with Durham Public Schools. Um, on an annual basis to update the generator numbers, right. and that's an analysis, ba analysis based on real time what we're seeing. Right, great, thank you. And then, and, um, Mr. Judge, likewise on the traffic impacts, can you just very briefly tell us where those numbers come from? Uh, yes, the, uh, the estimates for the uh, trips generated by both the um, existing zoning and proposed zoning are through the National uh, Institute of Transportation Engineers uh, trip generation manual. Those are just basically estimates based on the type of land use and intensity, uh, national averages for similar developments. Um, I will point out, I think one of the citizens, had, um, neighbors in opposition had indicated that the, the comparison numbers were based on 2013 data, and I think that was correct for the earlier planning commission. Right. Uh, those, uh, the 2015 counts, uh, were provided from NCDOT around the 1st of November, and that, that's, those are numbers are reflected in the current staff report. Great. Thank you. So 264 additional cars and fewer students, so the impact of the applied for rezoning would mean it would have a lower impact on Creekside than if it was built at its current zoning. So I have another question for staff. It looks like the right of way for Randall, the connection to Randall, um, at that would be, I don't know which way is up, but I think up north. That's on the back end of the development. It looks like that right of way exists based on what I'm seeing on the, on the like vicinity maps. Why are they not 
why is, it, why is there no connection that I can see from this development on the Randall? There is? Okay. So they'll, be, they'll actually be building a road there and, okay. <clears throat> okay, great, thank you. Um, now, can I get, this is one thing I always wonder, I'm always flipping back and forth between things like the BPAC letter and then the, 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 design, the uh, committed elements. I'm trying to figure out how, what was the response to the BPAC letter. Could you just walk us through, they had five requests and I think if I, if I understood it correctly, there were three of those were addressed and two of them may not have been? So for an answer about exactly what the response from the action developer was, the developer would be the best person to ask about that. But on a staff perspective, uh, we will look at the comments from BPAC and compare them to the comprehensive plan. Yes. And so long as they meet the comprehensive plan, we will still recommend approval. However, uh, there are some instances in the comprehensive plan where it says we shall seek and a couple of other instances like that where BPAC's comments addresses that concern in particular. Right. Um, the best example of that is the one that they have on there about the additional asphalt. Uh, the comprehensive plan says that if it's on a, uh, if it's shown on the develop a comprehensive plan, we shall seek it, but we don't require it unless they're actually doing road improvements to that road. Yes, so I wasn't actually asking you how it affected the recommendation. I was simply asking mm -hmm. which of their requests have been addressed by the applicant and which of their, um, this, uh, I would love to, you know, to just get a sim simple report each time, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I believe that's one of the things that we have been discussing internally as far as improvements. Uh, for this project, um, number one is the commitment that I just uh, talked about where we requested it, uh, but they are not producing the additional asphalt. Yes. Uh, text commitment two, they are meeting that by providing the um, sidewalk across that adjacent right. property. That's a text commitment. Uh, the remainder of that uh, sidewalk will be required at site, uh, site plan. Right. Um, the number three is already a requirement of the site plan process. They will have to provide right. bicycle process, um, parking at that time. Uh, they, are having, they do have a text commitment on there about traffic calming devices. Uh, and I know there's been some conversation between the transportation department and them regarding the traffic circles. Um, <clears throat> and then number five is the connection, which is the directly across the street, which there is a commitment about that. However, they are not providing the median refuse island that they requested. Wasn't there one about, I'm, I'm looking at my notes rather than, mm -hmm. I, I can't look at everything at the same time. Wasn't there one about bike racks? Uh, that's the uh, the one that I was referring to as a, a requirement of site plan. They will be required to oh, actually provide okay, great. bicycle parking. Good. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then I wanted to clarify, uh, Mr. Judge, maybe you can help with this one. I wanted to clarify the extra committed element. Um, at first when they started, I thought they were talking about what I think is referred to as a hawk signal, that is a, a pedestrian controlled um, signal that would stop the traffic and allow pedestrians across the road safely. and. As I heard the element read, it began to sound like uh, it was just simply a lighted sign on the, on the automobile approach to the crossing saying that there's a crossing ahead. Um, yes, uh, Bill Judge Transportation, the, the proffer as I understood it would be more similar to the signs we have um, behind City Hall here where they, uh, there's basically some uh, warning lights flashing over a static crosswalk sign. Oh, so, so there around. would be like overhead yellow flashing lights. Well, not overhead, around the sign, surrounding oh, the sign. Okay, right, okay. All right, thank you. And then and there was, I, I just have to make a little editorial comment about crosswalks and the fact that the schools won't let kids cross unaccompanied and saying, as a father of a 12-year-old who's now in middle school, I completely agree with that. If kids are walking to school, the parents should be walking with them. Um, they're just, they, these are elementary age kids, so. Um, yeah, I would have preferred a, is Hawk signal the correct term? You can nod, that's all right. I'm uh, yeah, it's a type of signal um, for right. pedestrian crossings. Right, okay. Um, so I would have preferred that, but I appreciate the committed element to the uh, warning lights. And um, something else happened tonight, but the, I have appreciated the work of the developer to address the concerns, and I'll support this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Welcome. Recognize Councilman Reese. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Judge, could you come back up for a second? Uh, um, there's sort of one 
clarifying point that I don't think we've ever really made. It's sort of been understood or assumed, but not. Do we let developers put stoplights wherever they darn well please in the city of Durham? Mm -hmm. No, uh, traffic <laughs> signals are, are only installed where they meet uh, traffic volume warrants and uh, act, there's also safety, accident, pedestrian crossings that are part of those considerations. But um, there are national standards that, that we utilize for determining when and where uh, traffic signals are appropriate. I've heard you speak before about this particular intersection um, and you indicated that you do not believe that it currently warrants the placement of a, of a stoplight, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. I just want to make sure that as we consider this proposal, we don't dock the developer for being unwilling somehow to put a stoplight in, which is kind of a little bit about what I've heard in the conversation uh, as I've heard it a number of times. I, I think um, reasonable people can differ about whether or not a stoplight would be helpful or harmful at this intersection, uh, at least with respect to the traffic problem that you identified. I, I'm not sure how a stoplight would necessarily help you much right there, but um, for the crossing issue, it certainly would help. Um, and I hope that the, that the uh, lighted crosswalk will, will uh, add a measure of safety. I feel compelled to point out, though, that there is conflicting literature out there about the efficacy of these lighted uh, crosswalk signals, about whether or not they actually are safer uh, or whether they act as a distraction to drivers. But since that seems to be what everybody wants to do here and the developers committed to it, um, I guess that's what we'll do. But I think the real answer is this, if, if this is a need that the community sees, uh, they need to petition uh, not only the administrators at the, this particular school, but also the folks who are elected at the school board uh, to make to find out to find funding for a crossing guard because I think that is the real answer here. But as that doesn't appear to be a land use issue, um, I'm I'm not going to uh, hold this up because of that. The other thing I wanted to mention, if we're moving on to comments now, thank you, Mr. Judge, I appreciate it, uh, Mr. Sozinski. I just wanted to say that. Um, in asking the questions that I did about erosion and gullyization, my, what I was trying to understand is how you believed that failure to proceed with this development would improve the stormwater situation in that part of our city. The pictures that you showed are concerning, but what they say to me is we need real stormwater management right there because it looks to me as though some developments have gone in around there that have been ineffective at managing it. And uh, as described by the developer and as described by our requirements, um, this is, there, there's going to be a, need to be a solid wastewater management plan for this particular site because, as you said, uh, the water moves out uh, to the north and into those areas, and you can see as the pictures that you showed, uh, sedimentation going into uh, the waterways there. But I, I, I don't know that that improves by doing nothing. In fact, I can guarantee it doesn't improve by doing nothing. Um, they could develop it by right and do much less than they're going to be required to do with this rezoning and under the plan that they're going to put forward. So that's the reason I was asking those questions, that I didn't understand how doing nothing was going to improve the situation. I don't think it will. Um, but I certainly appreciate you bringing that in the room. I think it's something that we all have to think about as we move forward. And I share Councilmember Shule's um, <coughs> representation that we have a strong stormwater management set of guidelines. Uh, we need to do more to, to think about how we incorporate some of the more up-to-date features that you mentioned in your letter and that Steve mentioned that, that we're using in other parts of the city. Uh, but I do appreciate you bringing that in. And Mr. Jury as well, thank you for the fantastic presentation and slide transitions, which were A+. Plus. Um, and uh, I know that I really respect your continued engagement in this process and willingness to come on a Monday night when you don't really have to be um, and to invite members of the city council out to your community to talk to you about it uh, because you're engaged in improving the life of our city and if we had more folks like you and Mr. Szczynski engaged in these processes I think developments would be much better for the people of the city and the built environment of the city would improve so thank you for your engagement tonight appreciate it. Can I ask a you asked a question? question? Absolutely. Okay um, just on the on the point of the lighted sign I was just uh, curious is that going to be pedestrian activated or will it be just lighted all the time? Um, it'll be subject to NCDOT's approval, but our anticipation would be that it would be pedestrian activated so that it would only, only flash when pedestrians are present. Okay, thank you. And then the second point was just on the text commitment uh, about the median refuge from the BPAC. Um, I wasn't quite clear on what the response, was that going to be added or, or not going to be added? The text commitment about the, uh, the median refuge island? We're not doing that. Okay. All right. Thank you. 
Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. I just wanted to thank you for the work that you did before coming here and for anticipating the kinds of questions that would be uh, required of you for answers tonight. Uh, thank you for working with the uh, neighborhood the way you did. Thank you. Well, I, I don't want to pro prolong this, but I do have a comment and a question on the stormwater piece that, that's been presented. And we've heard so much about how strong our regulations are. My concern is who's responsible for maintaining the detention ponds once they've been built? And let me give you an example. And Ken, you know where I'm going. I mean, if, if you go on Hernan Road, which I pass about four or five times a week at least, Renaissance Shopping Center, where they have a detention pond, and you can tell us about how, I can tell you how long it's been there. But the bottom line is it looks like a mud hole. Uh, so I don't know how effective that detention, detention pond is now. But I guess my question is, what are the guidelines, what are the rules, who's responsible for maintaining these detention ponds once they've been built? And they're fine when they work. But if they stop up, like I'm seeing the one on Hernan Road, I wonder if they still have the same value. So that's my comment and that's my question. Sarah Young, typically in residential development, the Homeowners Association has the responsibility for ongoing maintenance and upkeep of those facilities. Yeah, I think that's true. Commercial property, too, they require to submit an annual certification uh, that uh, conforms to the original design standards. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I would say, too, uh, Thursday's work session, there's a presentation on stormwater uh, about uh, an amendment to our uh, MPDES permit. I know we'll have plenty of stormwater staff there that probably could answer specifically about that uh, location, but also generally any other questions you might have about stormwater. Well, I, I'd appreciate that because that that is horrific as far as I'm concerned. I can't imagine it's still working today as was contemplated when it was built. Uh, are there other, recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, just one more point. Um, I should know this because I was on the school board for four years, so I'm kind of embarrassed that I don't, but um, I do think, you know, the pursuing the, the, um, the, the potential for a crossing guard there, I do think for your neighborhood is very worthwhile. And I'm not sure what qualifies as a place that you put a crossing guard. So it may be that since it's not directly across from the school, uh, that that's the reason that it's not there. But I just want to urge members of the neighborhood to continue to take this up with our school system. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I think that the chances of your success are good because I think that you know with n a number of people crossing that intersection, I think that the that uh, they will give it some serious thought. So I urge you to pursue it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, I, I think that concludes all the comments. The public hearing has been closed. Entertain a motion on the item. Move the item. Please. Then move and second. I assume that takes into consideration all the text amendments. Yeah. Yeah. Been, the profits that have been made. Is that the intent of the motion? Yes, sir. That's the intent of the second of the motion? Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? We'll close the vote. It passes seven to zero. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Uh, we move to the last item on the agenda, which is item. 20 public hearing to consider ordering a petition sidewalk on a section of Hardwick Drive. Good evening, Mayor Bell, members of council. I'm Robert Joyner, Public Works Engineering. Item 20 is to consider the ordering of a petition sidewalk on a portion of Hardwick Drive. The proposed project is inside the city limits and would close a gap in the existing sidewalk. Staff recommends that council accept a certificate of sufficiency for the petition, adopt a preliminary resolution, conduct a public hearing, and adopt a final resolution to order the improvements. Be happy to answer any questions council has. All right, this is a public hearing. You've heard the staff comments. I would ask again first all the questions by members of the council. If not, I recognize uh, Mr. Andrew Boyer, and as Mr. Boyer is coming forward, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item that hasn't signed up to speak? Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My name is Andrew Boyer. I live at 517 Scottney Circle, and uh, this is my uh, coworker on the HOA board, uh, Brian DeLaurentis. Um, and we're here because we really want this chunk of sidewalk to be completed. It's 128 linear feet, and we've been trying to get it built since 2008. Um, it is a basically it fell into the cracks between two developers. One came and built Wellingham, and they put sidewalks in front of all the houses that were there. But they didn't put it on this side of the house on Hardwick because it would have gone to nowhere. And the second developer came along and built out Hardwick and put houses down it. But they didn't put a sidewalk in front of the existing house to connect the two. So currently, when you walk around my neighborhood, which is a wonderful neighborhood, full of children and bikes and things, and you get to the end of the sidewalk and you have to walk in the street in front of Andrea's house. It's a hill. There's a little bit of a curve on Wellingham. It's not all that safe. Um, we understand that financing is tight, and we have offered to pay the full cost of the installation, and we are here tonight to please ask you to approve getting it built. Thank you. Um, are the questions of the proponent recognized Councilman Shule? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate your being here, and I was a little bit confused when I read the item, and I'm not sure if you're the person to answer this or staff, Robert, but um, the way I read this is one landowner adjacent to this property. And, that is correct. And this landowner would, is, is, is footing the bill for this? Correct. Um, but you said I, you I all were. I don't believe that's correct. The, the, the homeowner is all in favor of this. And yeah. She's signed several times giving us permission to do this. Right. But it's going to be the HOA that's actually paying the city. Okay, so. My understanding of the way our ordinance reads is it's paid by people who are adjacent. Maybe you all are reimbursing this person. I mean, I'm, I just had some concern about. Okay, yeah, that's there's a private that's agreement a between the owner. Is my understanding that there's a private agreement between the owner of the property and the HOA, and that the HOA will reimburse the owner. However, it will be assessed against the owner adjacent to the property. Is the owner aware that the that the assessment will be made against them individually? I believe they are, to the best of my knowledge. She has okay. agreed several times to do this and okay. has even come in previous meetings, I believe. In support. All right. Okay. Well, she's not here to speak for herself, no, uh, but you seem she's like not. you have an honest face, sir. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, and then just let me also just ask one other thing. As I read this, it seems like I was thinking the landowner, but it sounds like the HOA would apparently prefer for the city to do this work than to hire a private construction company to do the work, knowing that it could take some time and, and possibly cost more? Um, uh, from our preliminary estimates, our hardworking HOA manager got several bids, okay. and the bids came in higher than what the city wanted. Mm -hmm. And then there's the separate issue of um, getting permits, getting plans, then you've got to get it built, then you've got to get inspected. What if the inspector doesn't like it? From yeah. our perspective, it's worth it to us to wait six more months to make sure that it's done right the first time mm -hmm. and that it just gets taken care of. Okay. The city's going to maintain it. The city's, we would like the city to build it. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, you've considered it very thoroughly. Thank you very much for your answers. Thank you, Steve. Are there other questions, comments? Recognize Councilman Mott. Brief question. We're just, I think we either just approved or we're about to approve a, a contract for sidewalks. Right, big contract. Uh, is there yes. is this going to be able to get added to an existing contract, or does this wind up in a queue? Under the manager's authority, he has the opportunity to uh, add priority items and raise the priority of a sidewalk in this situation. Great. So Great. I would defer to him. Great. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll trust his judgment. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Any other person who wants to speak on this item in the public? Let the record reflect that no one else in the public has to speak on this item. I declare the public hearing to be closed. Madam Speaker, for counsel. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? We'll close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Okay, are there any other items to come before the council? Okay, in that case, in that case we're adjourned it. 8.97 p.m. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.